Hi, everyone. Welcome for joining us today um, in our webinar on storytelling and uh, infodemic management and how these two topics intersect. Um, my name is Tina Purnat. I am the team lead for infodemic management at WHO in Geneva. And today we are collaborating with the colleagues from Story Collider uh, to uh, bring uh, to you a conversation with two uh, experts uh, in storytelling and in the world of misinformation, um, uh, Miriam and Claire, um, who will uh, who promise to actually um, uh, give us quite a quite an interesting uh, overview uh, and discussion on how uh, storytelling can uh, be used for infodemic management and to understand um uh, the uh, to improve public health practice uh, there's actually three layers of narrative and storytelling uh, that we're considering here today uh, first the meta narratives that were shaped by our experiences and understanding of the covid 19 pandemic so how we told one another stories about people in our social circles who were getting infected or how we were looking for information on how to buy or or make masks and when vaccines became available, where to get them. So these narratives have become about resilience, about overcoming new waves of infection and how to adapt to day-to-day -day life in the time of COVID-19. And then the second layer is within these meta-narratives, more specific themes related to questions and concerns and circulating misinformation emerged. And this is what kept many health authorities busy in trying to communicate the rapidly evolving state of science on a constantly evolving virus and addressing questions and concerns and addressing misinformation. This has had to be done on a scale never before seen for any previous emergency or pandemic. And then the third layer here is the individual layer. Uh, those of you who have been doing the day-to-day -day infodemic management work, um, whether it's addressing patient questions and concerns in hospitals, or updating health authority web pages and social media channels, or developing job aids or, or FAQs uh, to address common misperceptions. Now, it can be tempting to focus on what is truth and what is not, uh, but really the point is everyone's experience of the pandemic is valid. Uh, what becomes challenging is when meta narratives that affect whole societies and countries uh, that they become so entrenched uh, if they aren't reflective of the best uh, available scientific knowledge we have. Uh, this is where real infodemic management work comes into play. Uh, here's an example. Early in 2020, most countries focused on mitigating COVID-19 spread and protecting the health and welfare of elderly people because they're uniquely vulnerable to the virus. However, it unintentionally added to a common perception that young people are not at risk and that COVID-19 only affected the elderly. So over time, we've learned how mistaken this belief is, uh, but there are many strands of misinformation that have leaned on such narratives and they've been pushing against public health guidance that didn't fit the worldview and, and risk perceptions that young people have. So, you know, globally, one of the most undervaccinated populations for COVID-19 vaccines remain uh, to be young people. Uh, young people are savvy to the ways of the internet that the generation of their parents and, and sometimes those that work at health authorities are not. So speaking in a language and format that appeals to young people that is effectively uh, effective across different corners of the internet is critical to address the infodemic in this age group. Many young people have associated COVID-19 uh, as a time of restriction, um, fewer social, educational, economic opportunities, and stagnating quality of life. So we need to change tactics to better speak with them about this ongoing public health crisis. It's the only way to build and uh, rebuild trust with people and connecting to communities and individuals who feel like we have not spoken to their values or delivered on the priorities we made to protect everyone from the worst 
of the COVID-19 pandemic. The experience of COVID-19 has not been equally felt by all groups. And with stories, we can help acknowledge and build bridges between stakeholders and communities. Telling stories, especially if person to person about our own experiences or the experience of those close to us, this is a very powerful way of influencing individual perception and behavior. Storytelling is a double-edged sword. It can be used to spread harmful and emotionally manipulative content, or it can be used to humanize the impact of the pandemic that tend to be expressed in large absolute numbers. So in this webinar, you will have the chance to explore all aspects of how storytelling and the infodemic intersect and how stories can help you become a, 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 a better public health practitioner. So we have two speakers uh, lined up uh, in conversation today. Uh, Dr. Mariam Zaringan, uh, she's a senior producer for the Story Collider. She's been producing and hosting shows in the Washington DC area since 2017. She's a molecular biologist by training, uh, but she traded in her pipettes for the world of science communication and policy and advocacy. Uh, she received her PhD from the Rockefeller University in 2017, and her writing has appeared in uh, Nature, Scientific American, and the Washington Post. So Miriam is gonna uh, speak first, followed by Dr. Claire Wardle. She is professor of the practice at Brown University School of Public Health and is co-founder and co-director of the Information Futures Lab there. Uh, previously, she was executive director and co-founder of First Draft, uh, a nonprofit uh, working on solutions to challenges associated with trust and truth in the digital age. Claire is the world expert on misinformation and managing its harms, having worked in a variety of social topics across several continents. So uh, welcome both of you. And without further ado, uh, Miriam, I would invite uh, you to take the floor uh, with, your, with your remarks. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for having me. It's a real honor to be a part of this um, great panel. So um, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world that you are joining from. Uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to tell you all about what it is that we do here at the Story Collider, why it is that we do it, um, and how you can join us. So first, who are we? For those of you who aren't familiar, the Story Collider brings true personal stories of science to audiences around the world. We do this through live shows, which we host um, all over in person uh, and now online, including in Washington DC where this photo is taken uh, and where I am currently based. And here we invite folks from all backgrounds and all walks of life to take our stage and share their experiences with how science has affected their personal lives. Uh, and this um, comes from the recognition that science is all around us. It moves in and out of our everyday lives in ways that we may or may not expect. And so science belongs to all of us, whether we are practicing scientists or haven't taken a science class since grade school. And we record the stories from our live shows and deliver two of them up every Friday through our podcast which you can listen to on your own time, wherever in the world you may be. And we also host workshops where we teach scientists how to leverage the tools of narrative storytelling to more effectively communicate about their work. And we're really excited to be partnering with the WHO on a series of workshops, which we hope you'll all be inspired um, to, to apply to and take for yourselves. And at the core of all of these activities, our workshops, our uh, podcasts, um, our shows, we are really committed to building a community, people that we are bringing together um, through all of these different mediums, all united by the common thread of science. And so why do stories of science matter? Uh, why is talking about your personal experiences with science such a powerful tool? 
So here I look at the social science literature, um, particularly uh, something that has resonated with me um, is this bit from a, um, uh, a commentary in Nature published by Dan Cahan, um, who says that people acquire their scientific knowledge by consulting others who share their values and whom they therefore trust and understand. And I think here is where our humanity, our experiences, our perspectives, our stories become great assets in science communication because they make us relatable and they set the foundation for a relationship with those that we seek to engage. It's the first step to bridge building that, that Tina talked about in her opening in, uh, remarks, uh, to opening up conversations around science. Still, uh, the prevailing culture within academic communications, at least as I personally experience them, rests on what is known as the deficit model of science communication. That if you just present the facts, present the data points, present your conclusions, then your audience will get it, right? But scholars of science communication have long known that this strategy is deeply ineffective when doing the work of bridge building because it is hierarchical. It's a one way relationship where you're saying, I have all of the facts and I am going to give them to you. So an alternative to this model that I'd like to propose here is the participation model of public engagement creating pathways so that your audience can engage with you as equals, sharing their knowledge, their interests, and their concerns, and you sharing yours in turn, again, in this sort of bridge building um, exercise. And earning trust and respect, that trust and understanding is really key to this participation model. So, okay, that sounds all well and good but how can we do that? How might stories get us there? And so here I turn to the work of psychologists Susan Fisk and Sidney Dupree, who study perception and stereotype formation. And they found that in order to be an effective expert, we need to have two qualities, competence and warmth. So when we think about competence, does your audience perceive you to be knowledgeable and capable? And for warmth, does your audience perceive that you have their best interests at heart, that you share their values, that you are being genuine, authentic? And so they asked participants in a study to rank different professions based on their perceived warmth and competence and gauge their reactions to these different professions. You know, how did they feel about them? And this is a very rough schematic sort of summarizing what they found. So on the x-axis, we have warmth, and on the y-axis, we have competence. Those who are perceived to be very competent and very warm were viewed with admiration. Those who appeared very warm but not terribly competent were viewed with pity. Uh, those who were perceived to be not so warm and not so competent were viewed with disgust. And those who were viewed as being highly competent but not terribly warm were viewed with envy. And here is where scientists and engineers fall. Now, you might think, well, it's not such a bad thing to be the subject of envy. But I think it's important to consider that this is a mixed emotion that includes not only uh, regard and esteem, but also some resentment, which is not the type of response that we want when we're communicating about our work. And a super effective way to get us uh, to notch up our warmth and get us into that admiration zone is by conveying our humanity, our values, our lived experiences to our audiences. And one way to do that is through our stories. So I've mentioned the word story several times already, but what exactly do we mean from a story collider perspective when we say that word? since it tends to kind of conjure up different, um, different uh, um, definitions in us. Uh, so very simply at Story Collider, when we say story, we mean something that has a beginning, a middle and an end. 
And crucially in the middle, something changes. Now what that change is can vary, but it is fundamentally bound up in a moment of insight or clarity or discovery. And so in this approach, we can think about scientists, for example, as the main characters, discovery as the central plot line. And science is then uh, the evolution of how we understand the world around us. So stories are this really excellent formula for delivering science content, for guiding our audiences through the process of discovery and what it means for us as people who are leading it and what it could mean for them as people who are really critical stakeholders in this enterprise. And stories are ingrained in us. We are hardwired to take them in, in a way that we may not be hardwired to absorb cold, hard facts. Stories then uh, provide the context in which discovery happens, which is never in a vacuum. And they give us characters that we can relate to and bond with. The stories that we tell ourselves and each other are how we make sense of the world and how we connect with one another throughout uh, the history of, of our existence as humankind, really. So stories also have this really profound immersive power that deficit uh, model forms of communication just, just don't have. And this power helps us bring our audiences along to show them what we see what we have experienced. Uh, you've all likely uh, experienced finding yourselves lost in a book or a TV show or a film, setting aside your current reality to fully inhabit the world that is being presented before you, the narrative that is unfolding before you. And that's a phenomenon known as narrative transportation, which is made possible by a combination of vivid imagery, capturing the attention of your audience and appealing to emotions, which is something that we're often uh, trained away from doing as scientists. And something kind of neat happens when we've transported our audiences. These two studies came from a group of researchers at the University of Tokyo uh, who found that when audiences were engaged in a collective experience, transported into a narrative, uh, by watching a compelling movie, listening to a story, uh, or some other narrative form of, of uh, communication, their eye blinks began to sync up, which is sort of uh, an eerie fun fact that I always like to share. And so stories when told well can be more uh, interesting, more understandable, more believable, and more persuasive. And this last bullet I think is really important to consider as you're mulling over this webinar later, because there is, uh, you know, stories can be this double-edged sword that, that Tina spoke of um, at the top of this webinar. Uh, and so when we're, when we're using them, there is an ethical and social responsibility that we have when we're using a mode of communication that is more persuasive. Are we using stories to help people understand something more completely, or are we trying to convince them of something? Um, what exactly and why uh, you are using stories is a really important is something really important to consider as you think about bringing storytelling into your work. And as we work with folks to help transport their listeners into their stories, we encourage them to bring their experiences, their fears, their hopes, their uh, sense of humor, their imagination, their interests, motivations, pains, perspectives, uh, and vulnerability, their unique voice. In other words, uh, we tell them to bring um, their whole selves to the stories that they tell. This is really what connects us to our audience and brings that warmth uh, and can instill that feeling of trust, which comes from being um, vulnerable and, and authentic. And bringing your full self to stories may sound kind of mushy, um, but it's what helps your audience begin to see themselves reflected in, in, what, uh, in what we are trying to do as a scientific community, to see our struggles, passions, interests, motivations as their own. And it's a really critical first step to helping our audiences feel like they belong in a dialogue around science to again, building those bridges 
uh, to realizing that participatory um, mode of communication. And I love this little draw a scientist experiment, which really captures what can happen when we let folks into the more human side of science. These images were drawn by three seventh grade students before they went on a trip to Fermilab, which is a national um, accelerator laboratory in the United States. And they asked um, these students quite simply to draw what a scientist looks like. And they drew images like this, pretty stereotypical sort of old white men doing sort of nefarious looking experiments, which is what that sort of green plume conjures up for me. And uh, then these students went off on their trip to Fermilab and got to talk to actual scientists, not only about their work, but also about who they were outside of work, the things that they were interested in, um, the, their lives outside of, of the laboratory. And so they got to hear about all aspects of, of these scientists, who they were and sort of what drove them. And when they got back, to school, they were asked again to draw a scientist. And they drew images like this, images that look way more like the people that I know who are doing science and who might have looked more like the people that these students knew from their everyday lives, beginning to see science and scientists as not separate from themselves, but as part of a community that they are part of. And I love this study because it so gets to the heart of why stories and why bringing our full selves to our stories matters. These small interventions can make a really big difference in challenging the idea of who gets to do science, who science belongs to, and who has the authority to engage in conversations about, about it. And that feeling of belonging can make our audiences feel more willing to engage with us and hear what we have to say, which is really essential to making science work better. It opens up opportunities for us to hear critical feedback from the audiences that we wish to engage, that we can then incorporate into our research and how we message our work and how we communicate about really important topics um, that drive us. And so I think of stories as tools that we can use to serve our communities better as partners in an enterprise that we're all a part of. And so with that, I thank you for, um, for your attention uh, and turn it back to you, Tina. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, lots of food for thought. Um, you know, also uh, health workers are uh, consistently voted as the most trusted source of health information for patients and for their communities. And I think, you know, also uh, stories could humanize them, not only scientists. So thank you for, for, for these really excellent um, points you've made. Um, we'll circle back with questions to you after uh, Claire's uh, talk as well. So Claire, sure. if you're if you're ready, I would invite you also for your opening remarks. From the other angle, the the health misinformation, uh, communication, and infodemic management. Welcome, Claire. Thanks, Tina. And firstly, Mar, what beautiful slides you are! You are a professional communicator. They were <laughs> chef's kiss. Thank if you. we all could do slides <laughs> like you. Uh, we would be doing a much better job of communicating, particularly in webinars. Um, I was transported. It was phenomenal. Anyway, so I'm going to try and do a little a little bit to, to, to stand up to what you have just shared. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and let's say, oh, slideshow. So um, my name is Claire Wardle, and I currently am leading the Information Futures Lab at Brown University. Um, but as Tina said, we do a lot of work thinking about the whole information ecosystem, the ways that it is vulnerable, the ways that it is being weaponized, and the ways that we can try and counteract those challenges. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our experiences there. But I'm going to start with my own little story. Um, which is that back in 2014, I used to live in Geneva and I worked for UNHCR. And as many of you probably remember, it was very much the height of the Syrian conflict. And so I worked in the communications department trying to get people to care about the refugee crisis. 
And I remember specifically as the numbers were ticking up, how did we get people to care about 4 million Syrians? This is the press release that came out. This is the way that institutions do communication. But the numbers were too big for people to really understand. And so in our communications team, we actually developed what we called tracks. And we wanted to tell the individual stories of refugees because people couldn't wrap their head around 4 million, but they could understand some of these individual stories. So this was a wrap up blog, but the boy, he was buried alive and survived. And sometimes I, I didn't like some of these headlines, but I also knew that we had a job to do, which was to tell these personal stories and to engage people. And so having to learn some of these techniques around emotion, individual story and lived experience, the WhatsApp wedding, the underground siege, saving lives at the river's edge. This wasn't traditional UN communication, but we were having to think about ways to take these stories of these many, many millions of refugees and try and find a way that people would understand what was happening. So um, from that, I now over the last six or seven years have spent a lot of time in spaces full of misinformation and conspiracies. And the reason that conspiracy theories are so powerful because they are fundamentally stories and they are simple stories. Life is complex. People don't want to hear about all of the complicated reasons why their lives have been turned upside down, why they're not, they're economically in, you know, there's instability, why their communities are changing. They're looking for simple explanations. And that's exactly what conspiracy theorists do. They weave these very powerful, simple narratives that are appealing, particularly to people's fears. Um, this, we, we, both of us love a good study, but this is one that I really love, um, which starts with, it says, recent studies on conspiracy theories employ standardized questionnaires thus neglecting their narrative qualities by reducing them to mere statements. Recipients are considered as consumers only. And later on underlined, it says, based on these findings, we present a new theoretical and methodological approach which acknowledges conspiracy theories are a means of constructing and communicating a set of personal values. Exactly what Marion was just talking about, which is this is about values and people make sense of the world through actively engaging in the process of understanding those conspiracies. It's not the simple passive, I'm gonna receive information and just accept it. It's about actively making sense of the world through these conspiracies. And so that's what we have to understand. It's the active audience. It's not this passive consumption of information. And this is a friend of mine. We went to grad school together. And at the age of 33, she lost her husband to a brain tumor. And she wrote this very powerful first person story for Vox saying, I was a conspiracy theorist too, because I needed to make sense of why my husband had died. It made no sense. The science was too complex, but instead conspiracies about a whole host of things made sense to her in the moment because it was a simple explanation of why she'd lost her husband. She now studies this. She is no longer a conspiracy theorist, but I think about it all the time about how vulnerable all of us are to misinformation and conspiracies, not because we're not smart, not because we're not critical, but because we're all emotional beings. And the way that we interact with information is not always rational. In fact, most of the time it is not rational. We all have emotional relationships to information. And I do a lot of work in misinformation and too often it feels like playing whack-a-mole with individual examples. So here's the famous one at the beginning of COVID-19. If we just gargle lemon and lime juice, we'll be okay. And so we end up fact-checking this example. We end up doing a study and sharing the results. But actually, that's not how people were making sense of the um, pandemic. 
as Tina so beautifully started this webinar with, people, they understand the world in a narrative way. And so this was some research we did in November 2020, looking at the narratives around vaccines. And the number one narrative in the English language was liberty and freedom. People were telling stories to one another about, I don't want to be given a vaccine passport. I don't want the government to tell me what to do. They were making sense of the vaccines through their own understanding of their own freedom. Now that's very different from giving people more facts about Pfizer tests. Like the two don't go hand in hand. So we have to understand the way people are talking about these issues in order for us to be part of those conversations. Those conversations exist. And too often we think, oh, over here, more fact checks are what we need, as opposed to how can we understand the ways in which people themselves are making sense of these new um, interventions, these you know, new science, new, new studies. So what Miriam did such a great job of was talking about these first person stories versus just sharing information. And those of you on this call who are infodemic managers, you probably do some of these things. This is a search on Twitter looking for people talking about their own experiences of, this is an example of the side effect of Bell's palsy. So I have a Boolean search query that brings back people on Twitter telling very tiny stories, but these are 240 character first person stories of their own experiences of the side effects. We need to understand the way that people are telling these first person stories because these are really powerful in the same way as Amazon reviews are really powerful when I'm trying to choose which lawnmower to buy. We as humans are seduced by this first person experience, even though there's, I'm not looking at the data about lawnmowers. I've heard that Clive hated the lawnmower, so I'm not gonna buy it. Like, it doesn't make sense, but that's what we're drawn to, these first person stories. And this is not a criticism of the Australian government Department of Health, but this is a 69 page PDF about vaccination, not one story, not one diagram, not one image, just pure text. There's no storytelling here. And so how do we think about the ways in which we are sharing information? Even at this level, how can we weave stories into our communication techniques? Because we have to understand how individuals are telling their tiny stories. So a 280 character tweet versus a 69 page PDF. And I've spent a lot of time working with journalists and journalists are storytellers. They write stories, they're literally stories. We might say articles, but they're really, journalists talk about stories. And one of my favorite journalists is called Brandy Zadrozny. She writes for NBC News and she has done the most beautiful, beautiful work in talking about the impact of misinformation on communities and on individuals. And this was a story she wrote about a woman who had joined online communication groups, mostly Facebook, about free birth, you know, no hospital intervention, et cetera, et cetera. A remarkable story that stays with me. This was from February 2020. I still think about it all the time because it's just a beautiful story of one person's experience that Brandy managed to really bring to life through her writing. Another excellent journalist is called Mariana Spring. She writes, or she works for the BBC in London, and she's their disinformation reporter. But she decided rather than focusing on bots and trolls, she wanted to tell the stories of the people themselves who had been affected by misinformation. So this was just one Twitter thread she wrote, but the bottom it says, first is this heartbreaking story of a nurse. And she goes into the details of how this public health worker, this, this um, uh, nurse had been affected. And she does this in a very un-BBC way. She's really understood the emotion of these experiences of those who've been affected by disinformation. So there's so much we can learn from the very best journalists who put sto real storytelling at the heart of what they do. And of course, audio, I mean, the beauty of hearing what Story Collider does is so much of this is about listening. 
somebody is talking, but we're listening. And that the difference between stories we consume via our ears versus our eyes. I mean, in many ways, um, in many countries, audio messages on WhatsApp are real vehicles of disinformation. People sharing first person experiences via video mess uh, audio messages on WhatsApp. Again, those of us who are trying to combat misinformation, how can we do more with audio? And I think that's a missed opportunity. But this is the bit where I get really excited, which is fundamentally, how can we facilitate others to tell their own stories? I just talked to you about Brandy. I talked to you about Mariana. They're wonderful journalists, but they're fundamentally taking somebody else's story and telling it for them. How can we empower people and create space for them to tell their own stories? And so one of my first experiences of this was when I was working for the BBC in 2011. And every uh, December during the holidays, they have a kind of a charity appeal. And the charity of choice was a homeless shelter. And they said, every year we tell the stories of homeless people and we never hear from them. And I just yesterday did a Google search for homelessness. These are the images. We see them, we know them, they're cliches. So what they did was give cameras to those people who are homeless to allow them to take their own stories, to tell their own stories through their own um, photographs. And it will not surprise you that they did not look like this. It was of their dogs. It was of their favorite trees that they went to in the park every day. It was about the friends that they had made on the street. And through those images, they were able to tell their own stories. And in the same way, because I was inspired by this, at UNHCR, we hired a photographer to go to Zafri refugee camp to work with children in the camp to teach them how to use cameras so they could tell their own stories. And it was called, Do You See What I See? And so these are just some of their photos. It was not of the tents. It was not of the fences. It was through their imagery that they were able to start talking about the trauma of what they had seen in Syria. That We pretended we were just teaching them how to use a camera. But what it led to was these young people having something to use as a catalyst to tell their own stories. And this is uh, an image that now is hung up in my living room, but it was taken by a 14 year old who it was sundown and he took this photo of his best friend. And I still remember Mohammed, he's now 21. He's still in Zafri refugee camp, but the power of that story that he told me of his journey to the camp through this photo has stayed with me forever. So this is just one example, but how can we as infodemic managers find ways to help public health professionals talk about the trauma of the pandemic? How can we help people who have lost loved ones during this pandemic tell those stories? I lost my grandma in May 2020. I still haven't had an opportunity to really talk about my grief for my grandma's loss. There's so much around us that we should be using storytelling as a way to make sense of and move through this period. So um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share this. I'm so passionate about this topic. I'm so excited about this WHO story, story um, collider uh, collaboration, because this is the time I think we it hasn't worked. <laughs> all the fact checks, all the PDFs, all the science, we've got to do something fundamentally different. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Um, that's been very inspiring. I've been uh, thinking of all kinds of questions that have come up. We have about uh, 15 minutes for questions and I would uh, like to maybe start with a question um, about you know, the bridging and the complementarity of what both of you have been saying. Um, uh, so the, the traditional way of doing communication versus how storytelling can bring uh, and complement this. So I'll start with Mariam first. Um, you know, you made a really great case on, you know, personal storytelling. And how do you think can then this personal storytelling complement more traditional forms of science communication? Because this is one of the big, you know, challenges and tasks of health authorities. Um, what would you say? 
Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so I think that my experience of sort of scholarly communications or just when, when scientists try to engage, um, relying solely on the evidence, the data that we have without the kind of context and sort of broader motivations for why you got interested in this work, why you chose to do certain things, um, sort of your, your um, the human hand that is involved in the process of doing science, the process of doing health. Uh, when we rely only on, you know, figures and jargon, uh, it puts up, I think, a, a wall around um, what it is that we are trying to do that is uh, removed from the context of how it is meant to be serving of what those data mean for our everyday lives. And so I think that, you know, inserting these sort of narratives um, that kind of guide people through what it is that we know and how we came to know it really can help anchor our audiences in uh, what it is that we are trying to do and its implications for them. Uh, I think kind of guide, showing people, it's our way of kind of showing people our work. And I think when we start to include those in our ways of, you know, writing papers or briefs or um, briefing policymakers, it also makes that work more comprehensible. I have a background in molecular biology, but I would often, you know, go to a molecular biology seminar series and be lost within the first five minutes because the jargon was just so heavy. And we were looking straight from jump at, at graphs and charts. Uh, and I had no idea, you know, how those came to be, but I was being told to just believe it because, you know, the P values were good. Um, and so I think, you know, it even helps, storytelling even helps for um, sort of professional pro to professional communication as well, um, because we are, you know, first and foremost human beings, uh, I, I think, um, and then, you know, scientists, health professionals, um, people working in public health and all of these kinds of um, uh, different STEM serving disciplines. Yeah, that's true. You know, you, you remind me of the movement that recently got started on uh, making better science posters for conferences. And that's a really big, big deal where, you know, um, you basically need to present just the gist and a visual. Uh, and that's the key takeaway instead of a lot of text and a bunch of graphs that, you know, someone would be standing next to a poster with. But that's also difficult sometimes to get accepted. Uh, that people would accept that type of communication versus the traditional poster. Um, um, Claire, you know, I was thinking as Marion was speaking, um, you know, from the infodemic management perspective, do you think that people need specific training to be storytellers uh, within this context? Because it almost feels like, um, you know, with all of the work that we're doing uh, and, you know, the, the stories and the experience that I hear from infodemic managers in the field, people that have been working with misinformation for a long time. We almost need to be untaught institutional communication practices. Um, yeah. I was gonna say that it's not training people, it's untraining them because humans can tell stories. We have told stories since we can talk. But what, as time goes on, exactly to Mariam's point, you go to university, you get told how to talk in a academic way and then you move into communications and people terrify you has it gone through clearance you know all of that and because of that we I think we've lost our confidence to be authentic storytellers so I think that's it's the untraining part that we need to help people get past and to say you know I, I love that chart about authenticity and you know competence and warmth that was one of the most powerful slides for me because it's to say most people are warm and competent but you're almost told not to do that, to be a professional. And I think that that is what we need to help people understand. I, if I could jump in, that so resonates, Claire. Um, I remember the very first time that I ever gave a talk to a non-scientific audience uh, just at a bar in Brooklyn to 10 people. I was so nervous uh, that I wound up crying on stage because I was trying to do a performance of what I thought it meant to be a scientist, stripping away and, you know, to, to do that performance 
felt deeply inauthentic to me because I don't fit the stereotype of a scientist, of somebody who is working um, in biomedical research. And so the so I, I swore off of public communication, public speaking completely until the story collider. Um, and I was sort of a groupie uh, and, you know, they said, you've been coming to a lot of shows. Do you want to tell a story? And I was terrified, but I had this opportunity to step onto stage as who I actually am rather than a performance of who I am. And to talk about my experiences, which I know down pat, like I have lived my life. I have lived the choices that I have made. I know how to, how to give that presentation. I know how to tell that story. Um, and that really just changed everything for me. And now I do public speaking all the time. <laughs> Miriam, if we if we just continue on this thought, you know, we've uh, during the pandemic we've uh, seen a lot of examples when the scientists and and health workers, you know, uh, picked up, you know, uh, their uh, they made themselves available either to speak to journalists or they made themselves available on social media or in their communities to answer questions and to uh, you know bring bring the science and the and the uh, information in, into their communities. Um, and that I think has a lot to do with what you're saying, authenticity, and then building trust uh, in in you know the the, the messenger uh, is important and a trust in the person that's actually communicating. Um, we think a lot about uh, maintaining not just building but also maintaining trust in science. And I, I wonder, you know, in your experience now. As an individual scientist, someone with scientific background that's you know making these connections when you're speaking to audiences, you know how can how can this make uh, how do you make sense of this uh, as far as overall building of the trust in science and contributions that individuals can make uh, to this and uh, trust in science and scientists, science communicators, uh, etc. Yeah, that's a that's a great um, and. Uh, not at all trivial question um, that, that I think about a lot. So I think that there's um, sort of an, an idea of, you know, to be a science communicator, you have to be able to communicate on all topics uh, and to serve all audiences. There, you know, there's got to be, you know, one science communicator to communicate for them all. And I completely reject that, that notion that science communication um, and what's really, you know, powerful, I think, about dipping my toes into this infodemic management community is that it is a community, that there are a whole host of people who can act as ambassadors, who hold sway with their communities in a way that I may not hold sway with those same communities. So I think, you know, cultivating a diverse network of people who are, um, you know, committed to giving trustworthy, reliable information, uh, who are committed to building as many bridges as possible, recognizing that there isn't one person who can do it all. There probably aren't even 10 people who can do it all. Um, and so knowing you know, who to point to, that I might not be the right person for this given audience, but I have a, I have a friend or know someone in my community who can reach them better because they come from a shared community, from shared values, from shared lived experiences that resonate far more um, than perhaps my experiences could. Um, so I think that that is uh, definitely one piece. Um, and the other is to recognize that one-off communications that we probably can't change someone's mind or uh, move them through a 10 minute conversation. And that's why I think stories are really powerful because they give people sort of an inroad or permission to share their own stories with us. And when we kind of create that relationship, it makes people sort of follow up. Um, can I have another conversation with you? Or I just read this article, what do you think about it? Um, in a way that if we were just sort of presenting a lecture and then say at the end of it, you can reach me here, you might not get, people might not reach out to you. Um, and so these sort of more informal engagement approaches, I think, are really, or just social media, people reaching out um, through DMs to kind of follow up and get more information. Um, so I'll stop talking there. 
No, you make a really good point. You know, when uh, when we're uh, when my team is doing analysis of narratives for for weekly uh, infodemic insights and recommendations reports, we actually take a look at how narratives have shifted, how people have made sense of things, how things have actually changed. Specifically, because it's not one discrete time point of analysis that one needs to make to describe, uh, a, you know, an experience of what people are talking about. Actually, the shifts are really significant and they add and provide the context. I mean, Claire, it's it's similar to also what uh, I, I was thinking when you were saying about audio and visual communication. So photo and voice voice narrative, basically, you know, how how, how does the storytelling look like, you know, on in the age of social? I mean, what's what would be your your take on the challenge and are we tackling it? So I think TikTok, <laughs> there's so much to TikTok uh, because in a short time, people are to camera often telling a story. And I think even those of us who are in infodemic response, I think many of us have been trained in text. We feel more comfortable in text. That's where we can kind of like, okay, I can just about get this through clearance. So the, the idea of getting onto TikTok to respond or to really use Instagram stories. Instagram stories is a storytelling device, putting static images together to tell a story. That is, a, that's the kind of thing we need to train people in. You know, we fundamentally know the beginning, middle and end, but how you translate that into, uh, you know, an image, a collection of images. I think that we all know this. We have people in our family who are excellent at, social media who are excellent at telling the story of the family picnic like they get it because I do think that's what we need to be doing more of but I think as I said audio I'd love us to think about audio snippets many of us in this space love podcasts listen to them make them but that requires people to also listen to 20 minutes or half an hour what does it look like to do bite-sized audio segments how can we think about that so I think those of us in the response mode, I don't think we're as good at this as the people on the other side, let's just say that. And one thing I wanted to say to your point, Mariam, is I study the disinformation ecosystem. It is participatory. They have nailed that. They are connected. They are networked. It is non-hierarchical. Everybody feels heard. Everybody feels like they have agency. The disinformation environment is participatory. It's our information environment that is top down, linear and passive. Like we're, we're the ones who are behind the curve here. So not to say we have to model all of those tactics on the other side, but the, the ways they're connected and they give people a sense of agency because they, they feel heard. That's what we need to do much more of. I agree, Claire, you know, one of the most powerful examples of um, infodemic management actually has been digital native health workers uh, who have during the pandemic or organized themselves, um, you know, organically online to to talk to patients and to answer questions about um, uh, anything related to health topics, including vaccines uh, in COVID-19 response. And that is something that is actually an untapped resource and a skill. Um, you know, the, the younger the younger generation of, of health workers, public health professionals who have grown up understanding the language of the internet, understanding the, you know, how to digitally also um, achieve that authenticity in communication. And uh, we need to be much better and much more, I think this is my personal view, we need to be much better in public health also being comfortable with crowds, uh, with unstructured, the power of, of interpersonal uh, relationships that has very little to do with hierarchy uh, and networks have to be much more looser and a lot more, we I mean, need to put a lot more faith in, in, in the agency of each individual person, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I had to go off on a, on a rant a little bit, but this is very inspiring. Um, we have about um, uh, we have a little bit of time left for another round of reflections, and actually, I'd like to turn it back over to the two of you. Is there 
anything in particular uh, that you would want uh, our our colleagues to to consider uh, in their um, in their uh, professional life or personal life when they're thinking about uh, uh, either uh, improving them the their own storytelling for public health practice for the professional for the personal life is there uh, Miriam over to you is there any final words you have Sure. So I think one is um, that you, uh, you know, we hope that you take the workshop or consider telling a story for Story Collider at some point or, you know, doing some sort of public forum. But um, it doesn't, to, in order to begin, you know, telling stories of your work, and I'm sure that many of you have been telling stories about your work, it doesn't require having some sort of audience and stage and microphone and fancy setup. Um, the people in our lives, our, our friends, our family are really, really uh, wonderful sort of resources to begin sort of cultivating this skill of storytelling. Um, and I think I've been thinking a lot in these last few minutes about what Claire said about just needing, um, giving people permission to be, to bring that kind of human skill of storytelling um, into our sort of when we're wearing our professional hats or coats or whatever, uh, whatever sort of uh, gear you wear out in the out in the field. Um, so just kind of practicing in, in environments with people who you know and care about and love friends, family um, can be a really great way to begin to hone these skills. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Claire, what about you? Yeah, and I'll just jump on that a little bit to say, we haven't talked, I don't think enough about it in this webinar, which is about the skill of listening, because by making space, stories emerge. And there's a great exercise, you might have done it at a work retreat, where in pairs, one of you has to talk for two minutes, and the other person cannot interrupt. And when you do it, you realize, A, how much we naturally interrupt each other. And secondly, by the end of the two minutes, such beauty comes out because the things that we say at first are our top of our heads thoughts. So if we got used to being better listeners, we would make more space for people to tell stories without even realizing because we don't give each other enough space. So we end up repeating the same stories. For this webinar, those stories of my of the refugees, I haven't gone back to those for six years. I've been in like misinformation land. But I had space through this webinar to reflect and go back to those experiences. And I'm grateful for that. But it's a reminder of how giving people space and opportunity, magic just naturally happens because humans are magic. We're flawed, but we are magic. Uh, yeah, totally. Claire, you know, uh, when we social listening in epidemic management is one of the basic practices of understanding what uh, communities and individuals are feeling. And actually, um, we need to also really be careful that we provide the space to to bring up, uh, bring out the the narratives and the experience when we end up contextualizing the infodemic insights and therefore the uh, making recommendations on how to address uh, what people's needs are and worries and then information uh, information needs. So. Even in our own practice, when we're developing this, I think your point is really important, um, not only on individual level, but also how we as public health practitioners and end up systematically uh, practicing social listening and uh, and understanding uh, people's needs. Um, so look, we we're, we have two minutes, and I will um, I will take advantage of the fact that I'm the moderator to put a plug in for the WHO Story Collider workshops. If I may, I'm going to share screen, um, but uh, please don't worry, everyone. You will also receive a follow up email with the link to to this page as well. Um, before I do this, I'd really like to offer really heartfelt thanks to our special guests today, uh, Mary and Claire. Um, I enjoyed your con uh, our conversation uh, really a lot. I hope you found their talks as inspiring as I have. And uh, thank you to the Story Collider production team and Brian Yao from my team who worked tirelessly to prepare this webinar. But this is not over yet. Um, if you loved this webinar, 
we have something really special prepared. Um, you have another opportunity uh, to engage more deeply in the topic of storytelling for infodemic management uh, in a special workshop series uh, that we're preparing uh, with Story Collider. So we're offering a training for three groups of people uh, by language in English, in French, and in Spanish. And these workshops are going to run at different times for different languages uh, during the months of August or September. So we invite you to apply uh, for this small group, six hour workshop, where you will be working with a mentor from Story Collider and with other participants to develop your story of the impact of the COVID-19 infodemic uh, and how it's impacted your personal and professional life. And, your story will be featured in a community storytelling project of the WHO Infodemic Manager community. So we will follow up with a link to the application. You can see here also uh, uh, the links and, and the QR codes if you're uh, itching your fingers to apply. We look forward to reviewing all of your applications and uh, working with those of you who are successful with the application. So really thank you uh for everyone's contribution to, uh, to today's event we wish you a really good morning good afternoon good evening and with this i would declare the uh webinar over so take care thank you so much thank you everyone thank you Mary. Bye. claire